Hi, thank you. Um, so thanks for joining me after lunch. I know it's a tough time, so I hope you'll enjoy this lecture, uh, this talk while you're digesting uh, lunch. Um, about a year ago, in the previous PyCon, I uh, presented a talk about Python and serverless, and uh, this talk will be more kind of a state of the union update of where Python and serverless are standing now. So, how many of you know what is serverless or heard the term serverless? All the others don't know what it is? It's 2017, guys. You should already know what that. Okay, how many of you are using serverless? Just raise your hands. Okay, only a few. All right. Oh, so, if we will take this audience, so serverless, it seems like serverless didn't change in the last year, but I, I uh, promise you it, it has changed uh, tremendously and uh, it's moving very fast. So it's time to know what is serverless. Okay, so my name is Benny Bauer. Um, I'm working as a chief architect at Wiscover. It's a pretty uh, new startup. Our mission is to tell the story behind design items, their creators, and uh, the places they're located in. Prior to that, I was a uh, um, cloud architect at Autodesk, uh, built uh, the backend side of AutoCAD and the web and mobile of AutoCAD, which is the leading uh, CAD computer-aided design, design application. Okay, so what is serverless? Uh, it's an overused term. It has many meanings. Uh, the main thing is that serverless is the ability to uh, execute or, or get a backend fun functionality without maintaining the servers themselves. And there, as I said, uh, different types of them. There's what I call the developer software as a service, the dev SaaS, which are, which are a bunch of um, <clears throat> designated services by, by companies uh, that provide you with a specific functionality. For example, Auth0 provide you authentication so you don't need to implement it yourself. Twilio for SMS and, and calls. Algolio for search. You can have a search in your application without having a backend. So these, these kind of uh, services uh, are called uh, developer SaaS. There's the second meaning which is backend as a service. So Firebase, uh, AWS Mobile Hub, they provide you uh, a bunch of uh, features that uh, most of the uh, mobile applications or web application will need as uh, authentication, uh, not notifications, and basic data storage, um, monitoring, analytics. Um, they are provided out of the box by these services. So you don't need to write any, any server code or backend code. But sometimes you still need to run your own business, business logic on the service side. And this is where uh, FAST or function, function as a service uh, comes into play. And the talk will be more about function as a service um, than serverless at all. Um, and for FAST, there are uh, different providers. Um, all the major cloud providers uh, have their own FAST solution, so AWS has Lambda, Azure has uh, uh, functions, um, Google has cloud function, functions, and uh, IBM has, or Bluemix has uh, OpenWhisk. So what is function as a service? It's, it's basically, it's a fully managed compute power that you have. You get out of the box, you get uh, provisioning of instances, uh, you get a patching of them so you don't need to maintain them. You get monitoring, you get uh, some uh, basic analytics on them, uh, logging and scaling, auto-scaling. So it means that it's less operations for you to, to manage. You basically package your code, your functionality, and uh, deploy it to this uh, provider. And this is, I think, the, the, the main thing that made serverless so popular is that you, you pay only for the actual usage. So you don't have idle instances. 
You pay only when the code is executed and you pay by the uh, hundreds of milliseconds. So basically it means 100% utilization of, uh, of your compute power. So how it works, you deploy your code, you define what will trigger this, uh, this code, this function that you, that you have deployed and there are many events that can trigger this code. Uh, it could be HTTP request, it could be um, when you uploaded a file to your uh, storage service, so let's say you're in AWS, you're using S3 for storage, you can define a trigger that once a file is uploaded to S3, it will trigger uh, an event that will trigger the, uh, the function that you want. Uh, same for database changes, for example, you're using DynamoDB, which is the database uh, service, managed service that's provided by AWS. Um, when something is changed in the table, a row is inserted, inserted or changed, uh, you can define a trigger that will run your function. You can also do it with scheduled tasks, so you can basically, you can implement your own uh, cron job without maintaining the servers that run that. Are, run that. And there are many, many other um, uh, events that can trigger your functions. And every, every uh, month there are new integrations that can provide new events. <clears throat> Once you have defined this trigger and the trigger and the event happened, the code will be executed, um, you don't need to handle uh, auto you don't need to handle scaling you don't need to handle availability you get it uh, by the cloud provider and the use cases are endless um, it started back in 2014 when at the end of 2014 when uh, AWS released lambda it was the the first uh, uh, function as a service uh, provider uh, it was only for file processing. So they had only the event of when you upload a file to S3, you can trigger a function. But since then, they're integrated, and the other providers integrated uh, many functionalities and the use cases, as I said, endless. You can build your backends with this. You can easily build the backend for a bot to, uh, to handle your things. Uh, you can use it for operations, do CI, um, execute the, the tasks of the, C, of the CI using those functions. Um, it's popular also for IoT because IoT is, is a, a use case when you have many events coming to you and uh, you need to be able to scale uh, and you want to do it easily and cost effectively so IoT is also another popular uh, use case. Um, and there are uh, many, many other stuff I have a uh, uh, lecture only about the use cases, so I'm not going to get into it, to it here. As I said, it's endless use cases. Uh, things to be aware of, um, let's say serverless or function as a service is not, is not uh, the perfect uh, silver bullet for everything you need, so you need to be aware of how it works. So. One thing, it's stateless. It means that if you need to m maintain a state, it cannot be on the machine that's uh, running the, the function. You should handle it, either store it in a cache or database or on the client side. So it's something that sh you should be aware of. Um, the instances are ephemeral. So when there is an event, they will uh, spin up, run, execute the, the, uh, the function, and then they might die. So maybe the next time that you will call the same, uh, you, you will call the function, it might, it might take uh, up to two seconds for them to run. So again, if you need a, a super uh, fast response, you should be aware of that. Uh, there are some hacks to overcome it, but again, it's not something that uh, um, promised by the providers that you will get a super fast uh, 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 response. There's another architectural aspect to it is that uh, the unit of deployment is a function. So if once we had uh, monoliths and then we, work, we moved to microservices and had to handle the, the pains of a distributed architecture, so now you, you have it with uh, much more dis distributed architecture, much more 
functions to manage, and this is also something you should be aware of. Um, there's an aspect of vendor lock-in, so most of the events are um, integrated to the same provider. So as I said, S3 is by AWS, so if you want an event on storage, you're tied to S3 when you're using AWS Lambda. And uh, so this is, this is the other side of this. So you should be aware that uh, the lock-in is not in the function itself, but all the integration and the event types that you use for the function. Costs are, uh, it's cost effective up to a certain point. If you have a constant huge load, probably uh, functions as a service is not the thing for you, so you should be aware of that. And there's, there are also limitations by the provider. For example, uh, you cannot, your function cannot execute more than five minutes. So again, if you have, for some reason, processes that take more than five minutes and you cannot uh, break them apart, to small chunks, then it's not the thing for you. Okay, so this was all introduction for what is serverless and what is fast. And now let's get into business with where Python comes, uh, comes into play. So what's changed from last year? Besides that, that I have uh, glasses because I cannot see anything. Um, so in terms of the cloud providers, so last year it was only AWS that supported Python. Uh, since then, there's also OpenWhisk and Azure also already support uh, Python, but uh, Azure is still experimental, so, so uh, keep that in mind. And Python 3.6 is already supported by those providers, so it's, it happened about a month ago, I think. So Whoever uh, is using or migrating to 3.6, uh, be aware that you can use it already. So when, when talking about function as a service, it's not only the cloud providers are not the only player in the game. And there are frameworks that uh, uh, help you with building the, the serverless architectures that you want. So Back last year, there were already Zappa, Serverless, and Gordon. Since then, there are two new frameworks that support Python. So there is Apex and uh, Chalice by AWS, and uh, we will uh, talk about uh, Chalice in a minute. And why, why do we need frameworks at all? Um, if you ever try to work with uh, function as a service in the provider's console, let's say AWS console, you will know that uh, you need to hack many things. So you need to deploy the, you need to package and deploy the function. You need to define the security roles to run this function. Um, you need to, if you're building an API to it, so you need to provide, you need to define the API gateway and glue all the things together. And then this is where frameworks come, come uh, very handy. And uh, with just a few lines of, of uh, code and just a few commands in the CLI, uh, you can deploy your uh, applications, manage and deploy your applications. So I want to I wanna talk about some of them. Um, Zappa uh, is, uh, is one that you can say that it's popular. Um, I think it's, it has about 4,000 stars on uh, GitHub. Uh, the idea of, of Zappa is that you can take your existing Django or Flask uh, uh, WSGI server or WSGI application that you have and take them as is and deploy them um, to AWS. It supports only AWS. And what, what it will do, it will map uh, an API gateway and HTTP endpoints to your, um, to your uh, server, to your WSGI server, and uh, once this, uh, this HTTP endpoint was called, it will trigger uh, th this lambda, it will route the uh, HTTP request to the endpoint that uh, you have inside your Django server, and it will execute it. And again, the nice thing about it is that you don't need to worry about maintaining the, ser the server that is running this Django, and you don't need to worry about scaling, and it's pretty easy 
to just take your existing code and deploy it to, to a Lambda this way. <clears throat> and there are some additional nice features with Zappa is, for example, it supports global deployment. So you can take your Django server and deploy it all around the AWS region. So it can be totally global, uh, fully available uh, around the world. It has also the uh, keep warm functionality by default. Um, if you remember, I talked about a cold start and the latency that you may get. So it has the hack built in uh, to solve this issue. It provides uh, SSL certification to your endpoints. And another uh, super nice thing about it is that when you define uh, in your the dependencies in your requirements file, it can uh, uh, scan it and take the uh, compatible uh, uh, library compiled to the AWS Lambda instance. Okay, so it will it will uh, <coughs> be compatible with with the uh, type of Linux that uh, uh, AWS Lambda is running on. Another framework is uh, Chalice. Um, it was developed by AWS um, and Chalice is just like Flask. Um, you, it, it has almost the same syntax, so we'll, we'll see it in a minute. Um, and the main difference between Chalice and Zappa is that while uh, uh, Zappa creates only one endpoint in the AWS API gateway and serves as a proxy to your Django routing or to your Flask routing, what uh, Chalice knows to do is to go over your endpoint annotations in the code and create an endpoint for each one of them. So you get many different lambdas. You get a, a lambda function for every endpoint that you have in your code. So it looks like this. Um, you can see, uh, you can see, uh, it's a bit cut off, <coughs> but uh, you can see that this is the application in the, ye sorry, in the yellow rectangle. So it looks just like, just like Flask. You define, um, you put an annotation of what is, uh, what is your endpoint should be. You can specify a, uh, an argument to it. And once you have it, you just do chalice deploy and it will go package your code, package your dependencies and will uh, create all the needed resources on AWS to deploy the Lambda and to, uh, to create the API endpoints and to glue all of them together. And a, a very nice and, and a unique feature that uh, Chalice has is that it can identify the needed uh, uh, security roles uh, based on your code. So let's say your code goes to another uh, AWS resource. So let's say it goes to S3, so it will know to automatically create the role that you need and you don't need to worry about it. As I said, this is something that when you don't use a framework, you need to do it uh, by yourself and uh, this is uh, kind of a pain to do that. Uh, it has uh, another, uh, another features like uh, uh, being able to run it on local mode. So it just creates a local server and you can just uh, debug it and, and run it locally. Uh, it sounds trivial, but in the serverless world, it's not that trivial to, to have it because that you're using many uh, other integrated services. So you cannot run a local API gateway, for example, and uh, Chalice uh, provides it to you. Another cool stuff, uh, cool library that uh, it's out there, it's, it's not a framework, it's more of a library that you can use for creating a, a distributed uh, um, uh, compute right in, in your code. So this example, sorry that it's cut. Um, so this example is using the Pyren library and what it does, it will just by this line of code, it will take the uh, scraping function that we have here uh, given uh, an array of URLs and it will uh, create a Lambda function of scrape 
and deploy it and we'll execute it on all the provided, provided URLs. So basically what you have here in one line is the uh, uh, packaging and the deployment and the execution of, of a distributed compute of uh, lambdas uh, just by one code and, and this example uh, was being used by Sean Smith to scrape a bunch of URLs in, in, I don't know, I think he did it in uh, less than a minute um, um, without you know, managing any resources. So this is pretty cool. And you can run it from your desktop. You can deploy it in another Lambda that will trigger other Lambdas. You can do it from your client, uh, whatever you want to do. So this is pretty cool. <clears throat> Last but not least is uh, the serverless framework. Serverless framework is, uh, you can say that it's the most mature framework out there. Uh, I think it was also one of the first. And it supports not only Python, it supports also other runtimes, and it supports not only AWS, but it supports uh, the different cloud providers. And uh, <clears throat> a nice thing that uh, serverless has is you can uh, use a plugin that's called uh, serverless uh, Python requirements, and it will automatically package all the dependencies uh, that you're using for Python, and will package them together. Again, maybe it's maybe it's uh, trivial because uh, your ops are doing it for you today, uh, but this is uh, very handy uh, when it comes up to using the the framework. Um, I can show you, uh, we have a few minutes. I can show you just how the serverless uh, framework looks like. So basically when you, you, you go to a command line, you do SLS create and the template that you wanna do. Uh, for, in this example, I'm doing a AWS Python. Uh, it also supports Python 3.6. And it will create two files for you. So it will create the serverless YAML that you see here, uh, which is the configuration. So all that you need for your, in terms of your resources and the definition of the functions and what are the events that will trigger the function, are, uh, they, it will be here. Uh, so for example, I have a, a hello function that the event that triggers it is a HTTP request uh, to the path of hello and the name that I want as, an, as a parameter, and the method is a get, uh, HTTP get request. And the second file that is uh, created is the handler pi, which is the function. And the function is, I have a function of uh, hello. Um, it, it, uh, it returns a response with the status code and the body that I want to return. And uh, you can see that in the body, I can go and take the arguments from, uh, take, take the input data from the event argument. So the event argument has all the, uh, the input data that uh, was triggered by the event. Um, so in this example, I wanna take the name parameter from the path parameters. And I also here, I return here the time, the time of uh, the current time uh, using arrow, and the reason I'm using arrow is just to, uh, it was supposed to be live demo if we had a good network. Uh, the reason was that I wanted to show you uh, the serverless Python requirements plugin that can take the requirements file and package everything together um, and deploy it. So right now, if I had a network, I would just write SLS deploy in the command line, it will uh, package everything with all the dependencies, create the needed, create the needed resources on AWS, and, uh, and will return me a URL of, of an endpoint that I can use. So this is uh, uh, very simple comparing to do it by yourself on the console. So I'm sorry that I had to run through all of this. Um, to summarize it, uh, serverless or specifically function as a service is uh, uh, emerging and, and, and fast and cost-effective way to deliver uh, Python applications 
other runtimes as well. Um, it evolves very fast. Uh, if uh, that, that's the reason that I was surprised that uh, uh, not many of you heard about it or, or already tried it because it's already uh, been uh, very, uh, I think it will be the, the normal way that uh, most of us will develop applications. Uh, it will be a hybrid. It's not only serverless, but I believe that uh, it will be the normal way. And specifically for Python, there are, um, for those of you who are uh, contributing to open sources or building tools, there are many, uh, many opportunities to, to contribute or build new stuff because this is only the beginning and there are many needs for tools and improvements and uh, so you're welcome to contribute. That's it, thank you. Any questions? The question was if you want to use uh, libraries that are uh, compiled in C code. So you can, you have two options. Or to look at the presentation, I had a link to the wheels repo. So you can look there if there's already something there. And if not, you can spin the same instance, EC2 instance, as um, the Lambda Linux that they use and compile to it and then you get your package, okay? Other questions? Thank you. <laughs>